I've got to tell you, the, uh, one of the great people I had a chance to meet when I was in California, a congregant of ours, was a man by the name of John Turtletaub. John, you may know, is a famous director. He's produced uh, National Treasure, Cool Running the Kids. In fact, you know, Disney always wants to do his films. And Jerry Bruckheimer always wants to be his executive producer when he directs a film and creates a film. So John said the most difficult part of making a film, believe it or not, is not the movie. And he gave the example of National Treasure. He produced this masterful film that was two hours and 35 minutes. And you want to know something? If you want it to be a bo on the box office and you want the movie theaters to be able to be able to play it every two hours, you've got to do a movie that's an hour and 50 minutes. So what's the challenge? How do you put 45 minutes of a great film on the cutting floor still be left with a film that makes sense, that flows, that you know, people can follow, understand, and get something out of. That's the real challenge, is what stays in the film, what gets cut out, and maintaining the integrity of the film. When we at the OU, through our OU Press Division, created the Rabbi Soloveitchik Siddur, the challenge that we had is that two-thirds of the perushim, two-thirds of the material almost, didn't make it into the Berman Siddur, the Berman Rabbi Soloveitchik Siddur. And that was a real challenge for the editorial staff. Because you have to have a sitter that's not an encyclopedia, that's something that people can use in shul, that they can carry with them and hold. On the other hand, it has to be a sitter that you can daven because you're davening. It's not a class. It's not like a textbook. So what goes in and what goes out? And that was a real challenge. What we're going to deal with today is some of the material that didn't make it into the Rebbe Soloveitchik sitter into the Berman Rabbi Soloveitchik Siddur. There's such rich material, because keep in mind what the Rav did is he opened up vistas for us. He taught us how to really relate to God, to have a relationship with the Almighty, with our sustainer, to communicate to our sustainer, and how to relate to ourselves, to open up and have an honest look at who and what we are as we try to grow and perfect ourselves in Avodah Shabalev through the worship of the heart that we call tefillah. So we're going to take just a few ideas in the next 45 minutes. First and foremost is that famous debate between what's the mechayev, what obligates us in the mitzvah of prayer, what obligates us in davening and relating to Hashem. So you see the Ramban in Parshas Baloscha quotes the verse by the Chatzosros, by the trumpets, al tsar ha eschem, if there is an enemy oppressing you, if there's a famine, if there's a plague, there's objective tsara. What is our response? Our response is vahareosem bechatzotzros. We cry out using the, the vehicle of, of tefillah. See, there's two types of tefillah. There's a tefillah, intellectual-based tefillah of ideas and thoughts, and then there's the crying out of the heart, the broken person, the truah that we're familiar with. What is Rosh Hashanah called? Yom Teruah. We cry out, a broken-hearted person, the shvarim are the, the, the person who's moaning and groaning. The truah is, is like a crying like a child. The shvarim truah is a, the breaking down of the person. Just starts out crying in a moaning way and then just totally breaks down and cries like a child. Shvarim truah. So we, we cry out to God. When do we have an obligation to cry out to God, to reach out to God? When there's an objective tzara. That's the Ramban. The Rambam, on the other hand, the second paragraph of Shema that we say every morning, every evening, he quotes the verse, You worship God with all of your heart. And the Rambam says there's an obligation to pray every day. To pray every day. Not just at a time of objective crisis. So here's the question. What's the machlokas? What's the nekudas machlokas? We never, in Lamdas, we never want to say, well, the Rambam's in right field, he says you should pray every day, and the Ramban's in left field in time of objective crisis. What do they, what do they argue? What do they agree upon, first and foremost? And then what is the Nekudas HaMachlokas? And the Rav explained very beautifully. You'll see this in, in Raya Not al Tfila, and it's in, in, translated into English in Worship of the Heart. The Rav said the following. That really the, the machlokas, the nekudas machlokas, that fulcrum, that pivot which they, they disagree upon is very narrow, is very close. And we always like to do that with any machlokas, whether it's in the Mishnah, the Gemara, the Rishonim. You know what? 
they both agree, the Ramban and the Rambam, that the Mechaev, what obligates a person to daven is Ace Tzara, being in a state of crisis. A state of crisis, that is what generates the obligation to relate to God, to communicate to God. But the Machlokas hinges over what is an Ace Tzara. How do you define Ace Tzara? According to the Ramban, we've said, it's an objective state, war, famine, disease. According to the Rambam, Eis Tzara is being a human being, being alive. Existentially, a human being is an Eis Tzara. What does that mean? That's why Ulav Do Bechol You constantly have an obligation. You constantly have a need to relate to God, to worship the Almighty. What does that mean? We know the famous Chazal, Hayom Khan Umachar Bakever. Today you're here, tomorrow in the grave. But you know, it's not a joke. Mrs. Charles Bronfman, together with her husband, they created Birthright, great philanthropist. Every morning, she would go out of her east side apartment, east side condo, and walk her dog. One morning, as she's crossing the street, someone runs a red light, runs her over and kills her. It's not hayom kanu machar bakever. It's this second you're alive, the next second you're no longer here. That concept, I have a brother-in-law, Dr. Ethan Spiegler, in, in, lives in Baltimore, Maryland, in nuclear medicine. And it happens all the time. Someone comes in, they're thinking they have back pains, maybe arthritis, maybe they pull the muscle. And then the slides come back, the scans come back. What is it? It's cancer that's metastasized throughout their system. You think you're coming in because you need therapy or because you have arthritis or, you know, a disc problem, and you end up with, you end up with a death sentence. Hayom kanu machar bakever. That's what it means to be a human being. Our life is frail. Our life is whimsical. Our life is in abeyance. And that's true of our wealth as well. There's a couple that I'd met in California. Their marriage was not just a marriage. It was a merger of two very wealthy families. It's a couple that can never remember the last time that they flew economy. It was a couple that had diversified its portfolio over the years, as one is supposed to. You don't put all your eggs in one basket. But there was one hedge fund, one portfolio manager, who outperformed all of their other portfolios, real estate portfolios, equity portfolios, you name it. And slowly but surely, over a period of time, they started reallocating all of their funds into this one portfolio that consistently beat the other portfolios. They get a call one day. They thought they were worth in excess of hundreds of millions of dollars. And they find out that they're worth nothing, that the last thing they have to their name is their home. And that estate, because of the tens of thousands of dollars a month to run that estate, to manage that estate, they had to sell. This is a couple in their 70s. This is a couple that are supporting some of their children. And they go from being worth one night hundreds of millions of dollars to the next day, having to sell their last asset. That's what it means to be a human being. Think about our brothers and sisters in Argentina in 2000. These were people who gave charity. When the peso became devalued, there was a run on the banks and you couldn't even get your own funds out of the bank. And overnight you were losing, your wealth was diminishing by a third, by a quarter, each and every week. And there was nothing you could do about it. That's what it means to be human. And that, being a human being existentially, is being in an ace tzara. It's true of our health, it's true of our wealth, it's true of our very life, it's true of, with our children. It's true across the board, with relationships, with what we thought were friends, what we thought were trusts. In that state of existentially being in a state of crisis, that's the Mechaev, the Rambam says, to pray all the time. In the Gemara, in Brachos, and Dav Chaf, and I'm going to see this Amad Allah from Abbas, The Gemara and Dav Chafam at Beis, well, it's analyzing the Mishnah. It asks a basic question. Why is it 
that just like of the 613 mitzvahs, there's a category of 14. 14 of the 613 are we call mitzvah sasesha zman grama. The zman is the mechaiv. What obligates you in it? The time. The morning of the first of Tishrei obligates you in hearing the shofar. The night of the 15th of Tishrei obligates you in eating or living in a sukkah. The night, you know, of the 15th of Nisan obligates one in eating matzah. Mitzvah sasesha zman grama. So, how come you don't have another category, a 15th mitzvah sasejah zman grama? Tefillah. After all, Erev avokah v'tzaharayim, King David says. Time to pray is, and we'll, we'll analyze what does that mean, but time to pray is at night, time to pray is the morning, time to pray is the afternoon. So if I prayed at night, I'm exempt. What obligates me in prayer? The sun coming up, or the dawn, I should say, of the next morning. Why are women obligated in tefillah? They should be exempt. They should be nashim peturos. They should be exempt. It's a mitzvah sasesha zman grama. And the Gemara says rachame ninhu. What does that mean, rachame ninhu? Ninhu, as you know, means they. They are in the rubric. They are in the context of the need for rachamim, for the midas harachamim, for that relationship with God, where they can reach out to God, where they have to communicate to God, where they need to repair themselves before God. Why? Because the mechaev for tefillah is not time. The mechaev for tefillah is what? Is being alive, being human, existentially being in an ace tzara. That's the mechaev. And that's the explanation of the Gemara and Chafam at base. Why women are mechaev to the same degree as men in tefillah. Debate practically. The Mishnah Brewer says women are mechaev to say an amida, shachris, and mincha. The Rav Zatzal wanted to say Mariv as well, because even though Mariv was not originally an obligation, once Klai Yisrael adopted it as an obligation, we were no hag to daven Mariv every night. So once Klai Yisrael adopted that, he felt they should say a Mariv as well. Because again, the eighth tzara is the Mechaev. Okay, moving on to a new area. Just a, a couple of questions. What is this idea in the brachos that we say, we start out, Baruch Ata, you. You, God, are the source of blessing. You. You know, if we meet with the president, when we meet with the president, when we meet with the governor, if we're honored to meet with the governor, you don't say you. You say the president, the governor. You speak in third person. That's you. And then it gets strange because we go from Lashon Nochach, second person, to Lashon Nistar, to third person. We say, Melech Olam, the master of the universe. So we start out speaking face-to-face, -face, speaking in a you, in the way we would speak to a peer, and then we go into the modality of master of the universe. So what's going on there? It seems to contradict itself. And why in the first place can you say you? That's question number one. Question number two. The Rambam says it tachanun, or what halachically the Mishnah, the Gemara, the Rambam referred to as nefila sapayim, falling on one's face. It's an integral part of the Amida. In other words, you can't have, halachically, you can't have a hefseg, you can't interrupt between the Amida and then nefila sapayim, falling on one's face. So what is the ideal prayer mode? What is the ideal way of relating to God? Is it face to face? Or is it withdrawing, recoiling, and falling on one's face? In other words, is it standing toe-to-toe, -to -toe, face to face, or is it that f collapsing and falling down? And by the way, it's very interesting. Whether one is a Svardi, an Ashkenazi, whether one davens Nusach Svard, it's not so crucial what we say during Nefilas Apayim. It's that we engage in the act of Nefilas Apayim. That's why there are different versions of what one would say, because that wasn't, that wasn't legislated. What was legislated was the body position. What is that? Are you supposed to be face-to-face, toe-to-toe with the Almighty, like partners, like equals? Are you supposed to recoil like someone in a state of tremendous reverence and, and awe? Seems to be a contradiction. Very much like the first contradiction of Ata and Melech What is Nephila Sapayim? Hold those two questions. We're going to come back to them. Next question is a Gemara and Daf Chavav. And let me just check one second. I believe it's Daf Chavav Amad Aleph. Okay, in the fourth parak of Brachos. What does it deal with? 
It talks about the fact that Avraham tikein Shacharis, Yitzchak tikein Mincha, and Yaakov tikein Mariv or Arvis. What does that mean? Abraham instituted the concept of Shacharis. Yitzchak, it doesn't mean that they obligated us because the obligation did not start at that point. It only became legislated later on by Chazal, by the Anshe Knesset So what does it mean? They instituted that there's a concept of Shacharis. They instituted that there's a concept of Mincha, and Yaakov instituted there's a concept of Mariv. What, what does that mean, that he was mitake? Question one. And the second question is, the verb that used, the proof text that the Gemara uses on Dav Chafvav, it says, Amida, Vayamod Avram, Vayamod, Amida. What's conveyed by that verb, standing, standing before God? By Yitzchak, it's very different. Vayetze Yitzchak lasuach basada. The description of Yitzchak's mincha is what? His tefillah's mincha, it's called Yetze Yitzchak lasuach basada lifnos arev. All right, it's telling us that it's at the end of the day, all right, before night. It's the end of the day, before night comes. It's in the field. Why do we have to know it's in the field? What's the idea? Lasuach. It's a, it's a dialogue. It's a conversation. Very different than Amida by Avraham, which is like standing from a perspective, you stand before God, a perspective of reverence, a perspective of respect. This is what? This is a dialogue. It's a conversation. And then finally, by Yaakov, it says, Vayivga b'makom. Vayivga, pegia. It's a confrontation. Vayivga b'makom. What does that mean? Confrontation. Very difficult term, pegia. What does that tell us about prayer? So let's go back. We've got Amida, Sicha, right? Standing from a perspective of awe and reverence. Sicha is dialogue, conversation, like we're peers or buddies, very different than Amida. And then Pigia, confrontation. And we've got Shachris, Mincha, Mariv, three institutions. We're going to try to bring all of this together. Amida and Sicha is what? is a very, telling us the very dialectic, our relationship with God. You, you notice when, when Rabbi Akiva created the prayer, Avinu Malkeinu. He didn't just say Avinu, he didn't just say Malkeinu. Because either would be a wrong notion. Hashem is not just our Father who's there to do you know, everything that we want, that our women need. But He's not just Malkeinu. He's not a distant monarch. Avinu Malkeinu, it's a dialectic. You know what a dialectic is? There's two poles, and you oscillate between those two poles. Avinu is a loving, warm, nurturing, friendly relationship. Malkeinu is one of awe, reverence, that there's distance. So the Jew's relationship with God oscillates between those two. The, the Ava and the Yira. Yira meaning awe, reverence. The Ava of Avinu, he's our, he's our father. At the same time, Malkeinu, he's our monarch. That's what's happening. Baruch Ata Hashem Elokeinu Melech Olam. You're Ata. There's intimacy, love, peer, friendship. There's a sense of that what? The Ribbonu Sholem is just that, the master of the universe. That's the idea, by the way, of the Amida and Tachanun. There's toe-to-toe, -to -toe, face to face. And then there's recoil from a sense of reverence and awe, a yira, yira saromamus, as the Rambam says. We just, we're, we just were in the presence of the Almighty. You recoil and retract. It's not so much what you say during the Philos Apayim. It's the modality, it's the body position that reflects your perspective. And that's the dialectic that we have. Where does that come from? That comes from the notion of prayer that Avraham and Yitzchak gave us. It's a sicha, Yitzchak says. It's an intimate rendezvous. It's an intimate dialogue. It's peers. There's warmth. There's closeness. There's partnership. And at the same time, there's a sense of that I'm a servant of the Master. Ke'eved lifnei harav, a servant before the Master. Amida, you stand with respect, with a perspective of humility, perspective of reverence. That's Amida and Sicha. Before we get into what is Pegia, let's just make a comment. 
Hirsch says this, Rabbi Soloveitchik said this, many say this. The, the Hebrew word is tefillah. See, prayer is a dirty word. We don't use the word prayer. Why? Because prayer comes from the Latin to beg. That's not what our notion of tefillah is. It's something much more engaging. It's an intellectual activity that's much more engaging. It's much more acute. It's much more aggressive in the sense that we're exerting mental energy, emotional energy. We're not passive. We're not just sitting there begging God. It's an experience of transformation. It's a cathartic, transformative experience. It's avoda. It's one of the few mitzvahs that, that Chazal, the Torah itself, quoting the Rambam, refers to as avoda. So what does the word tefillah mean? It's from the reflex of lehit palel, to judge oneself, to analyze oneself. Pilel means to judge, to analyze. What are we doing? We're lehit palel, the reflexive. We're analyzing or judging oneself before God. We stand before our sustainer. We stand before our maker and creator. And what do we do? We look very deep down at ourselves. Who am I? Am I honest? Am I, am I stingy? Am I, have I been decent? Am I empathetic? Am I a grateful human being? Am I, am I loyal? Am I wasteful? Do I have a sense of punctiliousness? Can you trust me? We deal with all of it. We look very deep down at ourselves, who and what we are. And we ask ourselves, what are our needs as opposed to our wants? Right? A lot, and the marketing, Madison Avenue is, is a whole industry that transforms somebody's wants into a need. That's how they get us to spend and to buy and to consume what we consume. But really, what are my needs? And why do I need them? And if God gives them to me, what will I do with these needs? How will I use them, employ them to make myself a better person, to make my family a better family, to build the Jewish people, to make humanity a better humanity? What am I going to do with them? That's, see, that's what pegia. The term pegia that Yaakov Avinu, that's described Yaakov's tefillah, he's about to go into a very difficult world. He's leaving his family, he's leaving his homeland, He's going into the world of Lavan, into a dishonest world, into a world of tr trickery, chicanery, a world of, of primitive paganism. And for him to survive with his integrity, for him to function as, 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 as who he is and what he is in that world, he comes before the Ribbon Sholem and asks for help. And he tells the Ribbon Sholem what it is that he needs and what he will do if given those needs. That's Pegiyah. It's a confrontation. A classic example of that is Chana. Chana, everyone is given up, her own husband is given up on her. She has this need to have a child, a natural maternal instinct that almost every woman has. She says, God, if you provide me with that child, I understand I won't use him for selfish purposes. I'll be able to fulfill that need that I have, but I'll raise him and dedicate him to be a Jewish servant, to be a servant of the people, to transform the people who ultimately will transform humanity. And what does she do? She raises a young man that she dedicates to her people. She can't have him. She can't fulfill those selfish desires that any natural person would want. It's my child, and it's an extension of myself. She dedicates that child, and he becomes the great educational reformer, Shmuel Hanavi. And he takes the Jewish people to a place that they haven't been. Moshe ve'aron, right? Kohanav u'shmuel b'korei shamo. In terms of great leadership, in terms of leadership that transforms the people and perfects the people, he's compared to what? The leadership of Aaron and Moshe. U'shmuel b'korei shamo. That's what she does. That's what a pigia is. We challenge God. We confront God. Not, a, God forbid, in a chutzpahdik, in a negative way. We confront God because we, we openly and honestly say, what, is, what are our needs? What needs do we have? And why do we have these needs? If God, if that's the midas harachimim. If you provide me with this, I will improve myself. I will improve the situation. If you provide health to this person, we'll use that health to accomplish. Not that health is an end in itself, but with the health, the person will be able to accomplish X, Y, and Z and do P, Q, and R for the world. The same is true with wealth. The same is true with, with knowledge. The same is true with, with all opportunities that we ask of God. All of the blessings that we're looking for. To use them as a means to an end. 
That's employing the Midas Arachimim, and that's a confrontation. We're not just begging. We're coming up with a system of repairing ourselves, of perfecting ourselves, of transforming ourselves, our families, our communities. That's the confrontation we have. And it's very crucial. The first mission in the fifth parak of Masech de Brachos, that mission is crucial. It says the Hasidim Harishonim, how you show in Sha'achas Kodem Tfilasan. What does that mean, Hasidim Harishonim? A Hasid is someone who goes above and beyond the letter of the law. I'm not talking about the sociological group from, from Galicia of the 18th century. I'm talking about the Mishnaic term, a Hasid. Who were the Hasidim Harishonim? They would go above and beyond the letter of the law. What was their Hasidus? See, a tzaddik is someone who does everything correct and proper and functional. Chassid goes above and beyond that, what the tzaddik does. What was their chassidus? The chassidim harishonim? You know what it was? They would wait. They wouldn't just engage in prayer with God. They would work it out. They would think it out. They would analyze it. What's, what are my weaknesses? What can I do to improve those weaknesses? You know, for some it's a therapist, for some it's a, being exposed to a great mentor and a great Rebbe and a great teacher. For others it's, it's health in a certain area. For others it's the ability financially to survive. For others it might be whatever it is for each and every one of us. And what are we going to do if God gives that to us and how are we going to use it? They would sit and they would work it out. They would sit and they would think it out and they would prepare. When I had the opportunity to give the invocation for President Bush and Vice President Cheney. And I knew I would have, it was 2004, it was before the election, I knew I would have the most powerful man on the face of the earth, I would have his attention for five to seven minutes. What kind of an impact could I have? He's going to be listening to me, as well as his advisors. And I spent hours and hours working out and crafting every sentence and every, every phrase and every sentence, and saying it in a way that would grab him, that would have meaning, that would influence. And you say to yourself, that's a human being. Hayom kanu machar bakever. That's basar vadam. We have the opportunity to engage whenever we want. Melech malchem lachim. The real power of the universe, the eternal power of the universe, the Almighty. And we don't prepare. And we don't afford ourselves to use that opportunity. And very often we waste and we squander that opportunity because it will make a difference in, in who we are and what we become, and it will make a difference in what kind of human beings we emerge out of the experience. Remember, the ultimate objective is not that the prayer is answered. Yes, we want the prayer to be answered. The ulti ultimate objective is the avoda, is the transformation, the catharsis that we go through in preparation and then in the engagement of that engagement with our Creator. That's Pagia. And that's what the Hasidim HaRishonim, they would wait, spend time and prepare and think it out and why they're asking for what they're asking for and what they will do with it if God gives it to them and how they will use it to make this world a better world. That's Amida Sicha Pegia. What is Shacharis Mincha Mariv? You know what Shacharis is? It's a prospect on the day. Vayash came Avram Baboker, that same verse. You know what the point is? When you wake up in the morning, you have an opportunity. God is giving you a day. What are you going to do in terms of the relationships that you have? What are you going to do vis-a-vis -vis the job that you have? What are you going to do vis-a-vis -vis perfecting yourself, the people you encounter, the people you come in contact with? That's the question. You're looking forward to that day. Before you just take on the day and go out there, whether it's to the office, whether it's to the Wall Street, Main Street, whatever it is, you put the day, you, you, you put yourself, you give yourself a perspective. You give yourself an agenda. You give yourself a purpose. You look at what can I do? How can I make a difference? How can I live up to my potential? It's a prospect on the day. Vayash came Avram Baboker. What's Mincha? It's specifically Lifnos Arev. The ideal time, the Lichat Chila time for Mincha is at the end of the day. Because it's a retrospect on the day. It's a retrospect. Have I offended someone today? Have I been insensitive? Did I waste the day? Did I waste the time that God gave me? The relationships, the opportunities that I was afforded. It's a retrospect. Lif nos arev. And why does it say, Vayetze Yitzhak lasuach basada? This I heard it from Julie Berman in the name of the Rav. What is a sada? 
It was the workplace. It was his operating room. It was his trading floor. Yitzhak was a cattle baron, had thousands of head of sheep and cattle. In other words, it's not all about me. It's not all about my accumulation of mass. I, take a, I look back, I take myself out of this, and I look back. What have I done with this day? What have I accomplished? It's a retrospect on the day. So then what's Mariv? Yaakov Tikin. See, Tikin means that they taught us that there is a value and that there is a purpose in engaging in a sincere dialogue with God and preparing yourself before you go out into the day. And there's a value in, on a retrospect on the day, looking back and analyzing what did I do with this day? And what's Mariv or Arvis? Didn't you just, you daven mincha, that's the retrospect on the day. What's, what's Mariv? Mariv is, psychologically is a very different time than Shachris or Mincha. It's a time of darkness, time of trepidation, of fear, of uncertainty. You know, we fool ourselves because th there's light at night. But let's be honest, when we have a physical ailment or when we're hurting emotionally and psychologically, when does it hurt the most? When do we suffer the most? Kumi roni balayla shivchi kamayim libech. What does Yirmiyahu say in, in, in the Megillah Seicha? It's always at the night when the pain hurts the most, whether it's the emotional pain, the physical pain. During the day, you're busy, you squelch it, you suppress it. Not necessarily so at night. What is Yaakov Tikein Arvis? That is psychologically a different modality. It's a different way of relating to God than you would if it was during the day. And that, since it's a unique and distinct psychological frame of reference, he instituted we can, we can grow, we can learn about ourselves, and we can perfect ourselves from that unique, distinct psychological perspective, emotional state that we call the state of the night, the state of uncertainty and trepidation. Mimama kin karasicha Hashem. One other idea that should be spelled out, and that is what? What does it mean? Avram tikein shachris, Yitzchak tikein mincha, Yaakov tikein arvis. What does that mean? The Rav developed this theme many times. He was bothered by the following question. What right do you and I, with all of our ethical and theological warts and pimples, we who are hypocritical, we who are whimsical, we who are fickle, we who have all kinds of challenges and all kinds of flaws, what right do we have to summons the Almighty? You can't summons the president. You can't summons the governor when you want them. You're going to summons the Almighty when you want? Who gave you the right? What right do, does a mere mortal human being, even if we were perfected, what right does a mere mortal human being have the right to summons God Almighty? The matter was provided by Avraham. When we say, we don't just say, Elokeinu veleke avoseinu. He's our God, we have a unique, distinct relationship, and we're following in the footsteps and the Mesorah that our Avos established for us. That's that beautiful dialectic in the Amida. Elokeinu veleke avoseinu. What do we say? Eloke Avraham, Eloke Yitzchak, Eloke Yaakov. Why do you have to spell it Avraham and spell it Yitzchak and spell it Yaakov? Why don't you mention Sarah, Rivka, Rachel, Valeah? The reason that each of those is spelled out, one reason why each of those is spelled out, specifically those three, is because they gave us the license to engage the Almighty, to summon the Almighty for a dialogue, for a meeting, for a rendezvous. They gave us the license. That's why it's recorded as well. The tefillah of Avram at Shachris, the tefillah of Mincha, of Yitzchak, Lif Nosarov at the end of the day, and the tefillah of Yaakov at night. And then the last point we're going to make, and there's much more of Od Chazon Lamoed, but the last point we're going to make is that very often when we observe mitzvos, the maisa and the kiyum are hainuhach. In other words, what I do, the action of the mitzvah and the objective of the mitzvah are the same thing. Simple example, eating matzah. What's the, what's the act? Eat matzah. What's the objective? Eat matzah. Taking the Dalad Minim, lifting the Lulav and Esrog. What's the act? Lifting the Lulav and Esrog. What's the objective? To lift the Lulav and Esrog. It's the same thing. It's Hainu Hach. It's the same thing. The mice and the Kiyum are one and the same. But the Rav said there are certain mitzvahs where the mice and Kiyum are distinct. They're different. We'll give a couple of examples for a minute. 
uh, the 11 Nihuge Avelis, the third parak of Moed Katan, the Rambam codifies it in Hilchas Avel. You have all these things that sit on a lower altitude. There are all 11 activities. Some of them are refrained from certain things. Some of them are actively doing certain things. Is the objective to sit on a low stool? To sit on the floor? Is that the objective of the act? No. The objective is to go through catharsis. The objective of the 11 Nihuge Avelis during the period of Shiva, during the first week, is to be able to deal, to come in touch with the state of deprivation. What I've lost, to confront it, to deal with it. The loss of a loved one. A secondary objective the Ramam talks about is tshuva. Since I'm in a state of mimam akim, I'm in this, this state of, of, of deprivation, of hurt, of pain, you look deep down, you're, you're much more honest. and you're, you, a, We all know people who grow through the, sh through the loss of a loved one. Through the Shiva experience, they take upon themselves the mitzvot that their loved one had observed. They take upon themselves a, a, a greater a, a sense of alacrity and a greater sense of commitment. Why? Because when a person existentially is, is, is in a crisis mode, in a state of, uh, in a state of, of, of pain, of hurt, they look at themselves. They're much more honest. They don't brush over. They look deep down at who and what they are and what should their values be and, and what do they stand for and what is life all about. So there are different kiyumim, objectives. The catharsis of coming in touch with the loss, the state of deprivation, the tshuva, many, many kiyumim. But the point is, is that the, the huge avelos are conducting yourself a certain way. The kiyum, the objective is not to conduct yourself a certain way. The objective is the transformation, the catharsis, dealing with the loss. Simple example, reading the Megillah. The Maisa Mitzvah is to read the Megillah. What's the objective? Not to read the Megillah. The objective is to be mefarsim, to publicize the miracle. To publicize the miracle of how God, through the geopolitics of the Persian Empire, transformed the destiny, saved the Jewish people from annihilation. Same thing with Kriya Shema. The Kriya Shema is a Mitzvah Doraisa. The Maisa Mitzvah is to read these paragraphs. What's the objective? The Kiyum is not to read the paragraphs. The Kiyum in the first paragraph is to be Mekabal O Malchus Shemaim, to accept upon ourselves God's mastery of the universe, that He, he is reality, God's, the, the oneness, the complete uniqueness of God, the complete oneness of God. What's the second paragraph? Kabbalah O Mitzvahs, to accept upon ourselves the covenant, that we're unique. We're not just human beings, but we have a unique, distinct relationship with God. That is the covenant of Sinai. A system of perfected ethical monotheism. We call it Taryag Mitzvah, the Torah. Third paragraph, it's not just to read the paragraph, it's to acknowledge that God is a historical providential God. The classic example of that was when God extricated, Goy mi of Goy, extricated a nation from the Kura Barzel, from the Iron Furnace, where no, no one ever escaped. And here a whole nation of millions walks out. It's to show that God is a historical, providential God. He's not just Plato's notion of the watchmaker that created the universe and lets it run. But he hears prayer, he interacts with prayer, he interacts with people. He is mashkiach, he is always constantly, providentially overseeing the, the events of history. That, the Maisa Mitzvah is the reading, the Kiyum HaMitzvah is something else. See, by Matzah it's one thing, the Achila and the Kiyum. The eating, the objective is eating, not so by Kriyashma. The, the Maisa is the reading of the words, the objective is accepting upon ourselves those three themes. Same is true with Tefillah. Tefillah, the Maisa Mitzvah is saying the words. By saying the words, you, concre you concretize the ideas, you, you, you make the ideas from being just ruminations in your mind, you bring them into the world of the tangible, the concrete. But what? What's the Kiyum? The Kiyum is not saying the words. Kiyum is Avodah Shebelev. It's the cathartic transformation where a person comes in touch with themselves. A person comes in touch with what are their needs as opposed to their wants. A person has a meaningful relationship with God. A person becomes more honest, more sensitive. A person becomes hopefully a, a, not just a broader person, but a more generous person. A person becomes a more ethical person, a more committed person, a more diligent person through the experience of the prayer, are more sensitive. It's not just my needs. The world does not, the axis of the world does not rotate around me. Everything is Lashon Rabim. All our prayers are in the plural. Become a much more sensitive person, empathetic person, 
when you speak Belash and Rabbim, and all of the different objectives of the experience of the Amida, and everything that the rabbis set up as a prelude, building up, going up the mountain, building up to that Amida, that is the Kiyum. The Kiyum is that transformation, that experience, where we become different people through the Avoda, through the experience of the worship. And that's why I mentioned before, the primary objective is not that the prayer be answered. That is an objective. We want our prayer to be answered. But the primary objective of prayer is creating that relationship with God and becoming a different human being, becoming a very different person. Who taught us that? Who gave us the license to do that? Avram Yitzchak and Yaakov. The Amida, the Sicha, the Pegiyah. We defined the term tefillah, analyzing, judging oneself. We talked about a perspective where you stand before the Almighty, Amida, from a perspective of reverence. We spoke about that there's a warmth, that there's an openness, that there's a closeness, that there's a dialogue, a rendezvous, sicha. We talked about the confrontation of Pegiyah, where we confront God, asking Him for certain, to fulfill certain needs, not because we deserve them, we don't deserve them, but if He gives them to us, what we will do and what we will accomplish with them. That's the experience of the tefillah. We said the tefillah, according to the Rambam, is, a, is something that we're obligated in each and every day. It's gender neutral. It's a function that a human being is in a state of crisis, is existentially in an ace tzara. That's the mechaev to Davin. And who taught us the way? Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. And that there's a uniqueness to Shachris as opposed to Mincha, the retrospect of the day, as opposed to Marif. And that there's a dialectic. And our, that Ava Yira dialectic that the Rambam talks about in Perak Beis of Hilchas Yisodia Torah, you see it in the Tefillah whether it's the position during the Amida as opposed to the position of Tachnun, whether it's the Ata as opposed to the Melech Olam, whether it's the Amida versus the Sicha. And that the ultimate Kiyum, it's not just saying the words, but the Maisa Mitzvah leads to a Kiyum of a different Jew, a different human being, a more sensitive, a more religious, a more decent, a more perfected human being through the cathartic, transformative experience of Tefillah of a vote of Thank you.